I think <laughs> I think it was something like like a very common keyword wasn't what's it called it, it wasn't actually a lexical keyword so it was something like it was like equals or var or something so you could have like a var called var but var is a keyword I forget what it was but Fortran does something like that because I read a post about it and I was like thank god I do not do like LHC programming because the only hadrons that would be colliding there would be my brain cells Okay, I think I think we're we should start. I'm not sure. Seems I broke the projector. Guess we're not starting. Now we're starting. <laughs> uh, okay, John's a big boy. He, he'll come soon. I'll, I'll uh, put on the microphone. Oh, it's on. Okay, okay. Um, I think most people are back, right? Anyone we're missing? No. Okay. Uh, I'll, do, do you happen to know how to do these? Am I, I going to turn off the projector? No, I, I turn on more lights. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. You're the designated light switch guy. You know that, right? That's what happens. Yeah, I'm going to have to tell Chris to go. Oh really? Oh wait, wait. It's, uh, sorry, I forgot. It. It's really dark. I'm gonna pretend I'm old. Okay, cool. Awesome. Woo. Okay. All right. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go. Uh, no, actually. Uh, okay. So we left off our compression functions. Is everyone clear on our compression? On what a compression function is? Just another one of those scramblers. The, the main. I guess. Okay. The the main difference between a compression function and an encryption function is that the compression function is not invertible. Right? That is the main, main difference between the two. Is that the compression function, you can go from hx to h prime, but you cannot go from h prime to x. And if you could, then that would break one of the properties, which I'm going to talk about next, which is, OK, we have two main things. One is collision resistance. Right? What is collision resistance? Um, we know that we want this to be one way. Hello, welcome back. Um, we, we would prefer, by the way, can you guys see the board fine? With this light? Okay, awesome. So we want this to be hard to return, like to go the other way. So clearly what we want to do is to have, let's say two x1 and x2, what's it called? Um, what's it called? Let, let, let's be even more formal. Let's say that for all x1 and x2, this is this, by the way, this is actually not, uh, I'll explain why this won't hold, but this is what we would like. Um, we would like that for all x1 and x2 in some, what's it called, message space M, right? We would like, we, and, you know, and then also x1 is not x2. We would like that h of x1 is not, this is what we would like, h of x2. This is, this is the property that we would want. Now, we technically cannot get that in reality because hash functions are finite. So obviously, um, there's not going to be a perfect bijection, right? Whenever like, your domain is going to be much larger than your range, some things are going to map to the same output. And thus, that is called the collision. Now, what we want, what we actually want, is that for this property, the, that finding these two such that their hash is equivalent is hard. That, and that is ex like essentially the basis of a one-way function, what you want, the property that you want out of a one-way function. So that's essentially like the main, the main thing. That's the, that's the collision resistance. And then what's it called? Um, Pre-image resistance is almost the exact same thing. It's just, it's just kind of switching around the variables and, and stating it differently. So it's just basically saying that if you already have a y, if you already know the hash, it's hard to find x such that. So it's hard to, if you already know, you know, if you already know y, so we know y, we know. So we know y. So make it hard, hard to find x such that h of x is equal to y. So we already know y, and it's hard to go, knowing that, finding the x. 
that is pre-image resistant. And then there's also second pre-image resistance, which is the other thing, like the, essentially if you have X finding Y, just the, the, the inverted, invert, like just, if, if this was, if these were categorical arrows, just invert them. Um, I don't want to go too much into that because there's not a lot of mathematical, like, lingo for me to talk about there. Generally, I guess your, your domain for X is like really big, right? Yeah, so, you're, so, so you want your domain to be arbitrary. Okay. You would want. Um, some hash functions, like, um, there are fixed length hash functions, but we're not interested in that, right? There are, but we, we don't care. Um, the compression function itself can be fixed. And this is why I got to this slide, like, this now, now that we, we're done on recap, this is what all the merkle Demgard construction is all about. That we want this fixed length compression because it's, I guess, practically, it's much easier, not really easier, but it's, the, it's, it's, it's much more straightforward to make the one way for that one particular thing really hard and then deal with arbitrary length texts later. Um, and that's, that's, that's essentially what it is. Now, we care about f like hash functions that have fixed output length and variable input length. So fixed output, variable input, that's what we want. And we need to be able to compress them like to any variable input string. So the merkle Demgard construction is actually really, really simple. Um, so for some IV, the IV itself is not fixed because that depends on the algorithm. But for some thing, whenever you hit that, if, if you guys want a diagram, let me know. But whenever you hit that XB plus one, so the, the, when you hit the last one, if it's not the exact length, you just pad it with zeros. That's it. You don't have to do anything special. Um, you just pad. You just pad the merkle Demgard construction with zero, and then that's it. You have your hash. But then, what I wanted to get a, get to with hash functions is that hash functions, in the way that we're seeing them, the practical applications, they we are concerned with integrity. So we want this to be. We want basically the h of x, such like, such that y, right? We want this to be obviously the same when we want it to be verifiable. But the problem is that while it, this does ensure integrity if you have a trusted source. So if you have like, for example, a bulletin board that you, know, you, you can etch things in if you're carving them in stone and you can post that, let's say the hash of my application is Y, then anybody can verify it unless you know, somebody, somebody manages to steal your application, like to forge your application. But, in general, this is only secure, like for verifying a Y, it's only secure if you have a trusted source, right? Um, because if you see in this little diagram here, which I took from some other professors of mine's slides, um, so we have, this is the, the, the usual Alice and Bob. This is how most, uh, most crypto textbooks talk about it. So we have our data, and then we have our hash function applied to the data, and it gives us this fixed length output of H, right? I'm like, you might. Thinking about the marker and the... Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. I, I did it. I was, I, was, I was figuring out I was cutting it close. So we have this little fixed length output of H right here, right? And Bob can take the data, can run the same function of H on, on this, and they can compare the bytes. And if they're the same, then you have the right hash, right? And then we're good, except we have Darth in the middle now. And because of this, because of the fact that Darth can intercept the communications between Bob and Alice, then hash functions don't protect us at all about that. Because if you can intercept this, right, then I can change the data and change the hash. And then Bob, you know, Bob just sees this new data, this malicious data, and he thinks this, this thing's legit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check the hash and it's great. But it's freaking not great. And that's not how you actually, what's it called, ensure integrity. So integrity meaning you want to verify so you, we're, we're not thinking about secrecy. We just want to verify that a particular piece of data is what it says it is. It's not being forged. Nobody's tampering it with, with it. And OK, this is probably one of the harder exercises that we're going to do. Oh, actually, before I get, before I get there, um, th this one's going to be hard. For practical purposes, I'm going to go a little bit into password hashers. Um, because this is going to be useful for you guys developing applications. Um, because no, unless you have an authentication server, um, you probably will have at some point to deal with user passwords. So what is, I guess, the only difference between a hash function, a regular hash function, and a password hash function, a password hashing function? That hash functions, we want them to be easy to verify, hard to invert. 
So we want this calculation, if we know y, and if, what's it called? If we know y and if we know x, we want this checking to be fast as hell. Super, super fast. We don't want to worry about, we don't want this to be slow at all. Um, there's some practical implications of that being fast. Um, we'll get to message authentication soon. But we want that to be really fast. But password hashes, we do not want to be necessarily fast in the same way. We want them to be fast enough, but in practical applications, hash functions are very efficient to do with field programmable gate arrays, as well as GPUs. So we need to have some sort of memory hardness there. Like, because essentially the, the main, if you guys have ever done you know, data science or you just know about it, um, a lot of the, the slowness when you're working with, for example, GPUs is just memory transfer. And essentially holding, holding memory inside of, you know, inside of that space. Um, so we're looking for memory hardness for password hashes. So password hashes tend to be a little bit different. Um, their, their construction is actually called a key derivation function which key derivation function is going to look very similar to our encryption, but it's going to take your password. So it's going to take some plain text password that you know, right? And it's, and it's going to take assault. I'll explain why assault. Um, so let's say this takes some, some 0, 1. I'm, I'm, I'm representing it in bytes, but it's really a string that you know. And then in, it also takes assault of fixed length, which you also know of some fixed length L1. And this, you, with this part, you derive a key. And then that in, in turn gives you the same thing that your other, what's it called? That your other hash functions gave, same thing. You have another byte string of length L2, which you know. And the main, the main difference between password hashers and actual and regular hash functions is just that password hashers tend to be memory hard. So they are easier to, comp to actually compute on CPUs and your actual computer than they are on field, pro uh, field programmable gate arrays and uh, GPUs. So that's, th that's the main property you're looking for there. And then also, we need to realize that, for hash and this is in general for hash functions, um, that they are pre-computable. So for any hash function, if you have enough memory, you can always make a table of every single value. That is totally doable. And for, for password hashers, this is actually called, has a specific name. It's called the rainbow table attack. Um, so the same thing, so this is, this is, and this is really the nice thing about cryptography. We get to reuse a lot of the stuff that we learned earlier, right? You guys remember the stuff about adding randomness for ciphers. We need to add randomness to the hash function as well, right? To so the password hash, this is a pass, let's, let's not call this F. I'm getting two mathematicians named their stuff awful. Um, but let's call this, PWH, Puh. but our PWH function is different than the regular hash function. It's going to be slower on a particular kind of thing. And in that particular kind of thing where it's slower, that's where the other hash functions are fastest, right? When you are looking at Bitcoin miners, they are stacked with FPGAs and or GPUs computing the same hash over and over and over again. And now I'm going to talk to you about that because that's what our exercise is about, but our password hashers are supposed to protect against this. So that's, that's, the, that's the main thing behind password hashers. This is why you should never hash a password with SHA, any SHA function, any regular unkeyed hash function. Even if you add assault, don't do it because it's all pre-computable and much, much, much faster than pre-computing a secure password hashing function. So something like Scrypt or Argon2, or if you absolutely have to, Bcrypt, but it's not as hard as it used to be, because Bcrypt was released almost 20 years ago now, because it's 2018. Um, preferably Scrypt, because it's, well, it's a little bit more formally verified. But you would want to use, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jot it down here, because this is not on the slides. But you want to, yeah, you do. You can, you can, and you can adjust the parameters on Bcrypt too. But, okay. but the, the growth of complexity for Scrypt is much higher. Um, yeah, there are there are adjustable parameters, and actually, well, it also has custom yeah, but it's but it's still going to be a lot harder than the actual SHA functions sure. or the CACAC functions to just parallelize. Um, actually, okay, well, then you know, um, I was going to show you the the, the implementation, but it's not very important. So, okay, now, 
um, I'm going to guess that everyone knows about blockchain because everyone knows about it now. That's how people come upon cryptography. But I'm going to pretend that there's one guy that doesn't know about blockchain, so I'm going to explain it anyway. Um, so in general, crypto, a lot of cryptocurrencies that are not based off of proof of stake are based off of something called proof of work. Um, and essentially, it's, all, it's distributed consensus, but our, our uh, implementation is simply a single node because we're humble. Um, but essentially, we're worried about, you know, a bunch of people send transactions, right? And when we want to, in a distributed manner, right, and, and we're, we're going to assume that we have a trusted publisher, right, we need a way to essentially take all these transactions, so let's call them all these little things are transactions, T1, T2, T3, T4, and we're going to work essentially kind of like on time intervals. So from T1, so from time T1 to time T2, um, we're get, we, get, we receive a bunch of transactions, and then we group all these together in a block, right? And then we group all these together in a block, and then we do something, we create a data structure here called a Merkle tree. Um, and I'm going to make this a half exercise. I'm going to give people like five minutes to get started on this when I started, but it's very complicated. So it's very complicated if you don't know already Scala and CATS and FS2 and all that stuff. So most likely I'm going to go through it with you guys. Um, but you take these, and now first I get the hash of this. So let's call this H1. This is the hash of this transaction T1. This is, well, I'm explaining Merkle tree specifically. Um, then I get the hash of T2 hash of T3, and I'm pretty sure that the people next door uh, talked about this probably an hour ago, but because um, they're all about that blockchain. But So we first take all the hashes of every single leaf, and then we take, remember that for hashes, we can concatenate strings, and we can just hash them again. So the hash of this internal node is actually just the hash of H1 concatenated with H2. So this is what goes actually inside of this block. So this is one of the things that goes inside of this block. Then the other thing that's part of this block is, as I said, the timestamp. So we're going to have some, like, why does everything start with T, man? Transactions, time, everything's T. So we're going to have some time. I'm just going to call it time. We have a timestamp here. And we have, so this, this is our, our essentially our basic building block. Now, we're not going to talk about digital signatures yet. we get to that later. Um, so for our very dumb blockchain, we're going to consider how proof of work works. Um, and it's a very simple idea. You guys already know that hash functions are li like just bit strings, right? Um, and when you hash something, if I hash, you know, hash the string high in bytes, I'm going to get gibberish. It's going to say 0, no, it's going to say 0, 1, 5, x, 3, blah, right? If, let's say we converted that into a format that looks like that. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to look like gibberish. Proof of work has something, a parameter called hardness and a parameter, um, and actually mostly just hardness. So what proof of work wants to do is that proof of work wants you to get a string like this, but in a very specific format. And the way the one in Bitcoin works is that it wants you to have a specific amount of zeros at the beginning, right? And the one that we're going to see is going to only have one zero, so it's going to compete in you know like less than a second. But um, in general, this, this is how Bitcoin works. And of course, the hardness parameter is much, much higher. But in general, let's say your security parameter is n, number of zeros, then we have to find a hash, of course, n can't be larger than the number of the hash, of course. And that's actually why there are finite number of Bitcoins. Um, so when, when eventually Bitcoin reaches where everything else is zero, you're out. You no longer can. That's not the reason. That's not? It's not. But really? We'll talk, we can talk about that. I mean, that's the specific implementation, though, I think. But OK, you're, you're right. Explain why I, had a break, but like... I thought that was why. OK. You, you, you're probably right. OK. But let's assume it's this way. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. I'm, I'm really not a, like a blockchain guy very much. But some of the hardness parameter that you compute is essentially I want this to have n zeros at the beginning. So 0, 0, 0, blah, 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 to n. And then here's the part that's nice about one-way functions. This is so because you are looking for something of a particular shape, 
it's going to be very, you, you, I'm not going to be able to give you an arbitrary zero string and you're not going to be able to go back and find me the X parameter. So the way proof of work is hard is that it's essentially almost randomized. You just kind of have to keep trying a bunch of different ones. So you just, so you, you start, you know, I start hashing, uh, I have to keep erasing, but I have to, let's say the transaction for some silly reason is high. So first I start hashing high and then this doesn't give me a zero. Then I start hashing high one. I had some, some random thing. It doesn't have to be one or sequential at all. But I start with high one and it, I get some other thing. And I keep adding randomness until I get a zero or n zeros at the beginning. And that's essentially why, that's how proof of work works. And then, I mean, the, the actual implementation is more complicated, as he sa said, and also it's distributed consensus. So it's more, it, it's a certain amount of nodes agreeing to what is actually the correct thing. So remember, this is not, this is not like a private key. This is, this is, everyone has this. So like everyone essentially gets this from some source. So it is possible that transactions do come, like what's it called? They, they might come out of order or they, they might come, you know, in a different way. So there has to be some consensus. They could be reordered. They could have a different, completely different transactions in a different in a block in the same block on the same timestamp. So it has to be a certain number of nodes hashing this, and they say we agreed on this one. This is the one that we're actually going to publish to the blockchain. That's about distributing consensus. But I'm not going too deep on that because this is a cryptography talk, not a blockchain talk. So I'm sorry for being wrong about that. No, no, no worries. But no, no, I mean it's totally fine. Um, call me out when it's when it's totally you know doable. But that's what we're talking, so this is what we're going to do at first for our really uh, lame, like lame blockchain. So we are actually, so we're going to go now to the hash exercises module. So this one, okay, this one's going to be a lot, this has a lot of Scala specific abstractions. And on top of this, this is using an HTTP framework called HTTP4S. So I'm going to explain what I'm doing to begin with. Um, I think I'm just going to code it live. I mean, there's no, there's no, uh, I don't think there's going to be a benefit in just letting you guys try it because a lot of you aren't um, familiar with Scala. Um, if you want to try it yourself, just plug your ears and then come back when I'm done. Um, sorry, it's uh, the, you can follow along under hash exercises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to start with it. Um, I have not started. So let me close this, a bunch of these, and start from scratch. So let's, let's, let's do what that thing that we talked about. Let's call it, I call it Doge Chain. But it's, uh, it's essentially, um, actually, let, let's start from the bottom up. We're going to have uh, essentially an abstract data type. If, if this was Haskell, um, you would, this is just the Scala way of writing, what's it called? Um, plus some, some really OO inheritance of saying, you know, that uh, Merkle tree A is equal to Merkle whole tree, I'm oh, sorry, node, what's it called? Merkle tree A, Merkle tree A, and hash A, or leaf content, Hash a, that's it. I mean, this is the this is the the Scala encoding of that, um, of your algebraic data types. It has some drawbacks, like in the sense that um, algebraic data types, node and leaf are not a type in Haskell, which is the nice way to do it. In Scala, they are a type. So sometimes you're gonna get some really n annoying signatures in that if you just use type inference, it might return a leaf, might leaf as a type, but under the Scalazi subset of Scala, which is the one that we work on, we pretend this doesn't happen and call it a day. I'm, I'm serious, this is how we work, but um, this is essentially it. And this is, by the way, this is a generic one because we use this construct in two, in two different modules. So we can consider the content as a byte array and the hash as a hash. I mean, the hash is also a byte array, by the way. This is just a new type. Uh, it's just a new type for type safety, but um, just because the way that we actually get a hash in the shape is that we're gonna call a function to get it. Um, and this is our encoding for our Merkle tree, a very, very basic Merkle tree. And I say super basic because I'm not checking that it's balanced. Merkle trees should be balanced binary trees, meaning obviously there's same number of leaves on both sides, same depth. 
but this is not balanced. This is, so we're, we're going to assume that you people are mature and you're not going to cheat. Um, well, actually, I'm the one writing it, so I'm not going to cheat. Um, but th this is, this is our, our uh, not good Merkle tree. And then we have our Do Deutsch chain, which is, and this is a generic one. So we have a block which consists of a nonce. We're going to count it as an integer because it's easier to think about that way. Um, a nonce does not have to have, be an integer. It's technically a byte array. Um, but we're going we're gonna to consider nonce to be an integer, just for simplicity. I want to make it sure. So we have something, what I'm calling almost block, right? This is before we have a block, we have a message, and we have the timestamp of that message of, of when all these, uh, this miracle tree was gathered. And this is the part where we need to apply this proof of work algorithm. So once we actually get the hash of the nonce that gives us a particular shape, a particular hardness, right? So n zeros, we're only going to do it for one zero. But when we do this for, um, when we perform this on almost block, we should get a block. Oh, that's what we're solving for, essentially. And then um, everything else here, I don't know why I have a package object. I had something there, but I erased it. Um, then we have essentially the function that we're going to essentially implement are we're going to call fold to tree. So what our thing is, is actually we're not, we're not a coin. We're actually just a bulletin board. That's it. So we're, we're a bunch of people, a bunch of happy people sending messages to each other, uh, not non-explicit messages. And um, we are going to cryptographically hash those in a chain, in a very, very basic blockchain. Um, so we're going we're gonna to have two functions that we need to implement, essentially. One's called Fulcher Tree, where we take all the messages and we turn that into a Merkle tree. And then we're going to call work. And work is that where we take the almost block and the hardness, and then we're going to return a block. That's it. And this is actually going to run really fast because we're using SHA-1, which not even Bitcoin uses it. It's so weak. Um, but I mean, I, 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 want, I wanted my exercise to finish before we all fell asleep. So I, I, I set the hardness down and I used a really weak hash function. Um, so that's why. I mean, I'm pretty sure even if I use 512, it would be easy. I mean, probabilistically, 1 in 10 is going to give me, it's going to give me a zero at the, at the front. But, you know, I just wanted to be extra explicit that this is super weak. So. And then aside from that, um, this is very now. This is the HTTP for specific abstractions. I'm not going to go into this too much, but I'm I'm just going to explain what it's going happening. And this is this is how idiomatic FP Scala looks like. Um, so yeah, it's going to look a lot of, a lot of stuff. So ref, uh, think about this as, as IO ref. We happen to have more than one IO monad in Scala, so this is yeah. Don't let's let's not let's not go into that. Uh, we have more than one IO monad in Scala let's just let, because it's not supported by the runtime, so people made their own. Um, so let's just, let's just start with that. Um, we have ref, call this IO ref. This is literally just IO ref, and it's an IO ref of a list of BB message. Because this, this is a super, super, like, not, you know, industry ready thing, right? I just kind of want to, like, hold, you know, keep track of people sending me messages and a timestamp. That's all. And if there is a block or not. So we have an IO ref of a list of BB message, a hardness parameter, which is also an IO ref because it's configurable. It could, and, and in, in real, I mean, I, I'm even though I'm not gonna touch that, in reality, this, the, like server hard, like, cha like hardness changes in Bitcoin, um, depending on the traffic, depending on how many transactions, um, and also because you eventually mine all the blocks, but yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, and then you have, your IRF of the chain, the blockchain, because of course, whenever we, it's gonna be an immutable one, of course, but so whenever we append a new block, we're gonna prepend a new block um, onto this linked list. Um, of course, we have to alter it. Um, then we have an indicator of whether, so the, the only reason this last block thing exists is that we're assuming that our little server, um, we can call this function to compute the last block only once, just so I don't spam it and DDoS myself. Um, and then this is an implementation specific thing to Scala. I'm not going to get into that. So this is our HTTP for us DSL. Um, you start at some root function. This is, so for example, this, like let's say case post roost, um, <laughs> roost, um, root tick is if my URL was localhost, this would be a localhost. Usually it's the port, like, you know, to 8080 and then slash tick. That's all the DSL is. 
So this is, this is saying at wherever we mount it, if it's johndegoes.com or if it's just localhost 8080, then it's going to be, um, this is going to be the root for, for when you call, when you use the tick URL. Um, so tick is going to be what we do when we want to start computing our fold to tree and our proof of work. Um, so yeah, this, this is going to be essentially what we do. Hello. Okay, so this is gonna, like, w when we do tick, we're gonna say, okay, we are ready to start doing work. This is, again, this is literally just an implementation thing. This is not how it would actually look like in industry. Um, and then we have a root that says do work, and all this does is that if, if there's a, if tick has been called, then we're gonna run our function that's called work. That, those are the ones that were in question mark before. And then we also have, one, uh, literally just a post request that's going to send the message. So we're, we're, this is, we're only going to um, worry with implementing the stuff for the hash functions. Now, I'm just going to do it because this has a lot of Scala-specific abstractions. So let's, I'm going I'm to talk about it in an abstract way. So what do we need to do here? So our, our, imagine that we have an odd number of messages. Right? And we need a balanced binary tree. Um, so the way, the super dead simple way a Merkle tree can, do, can deal with this, and by the way, there are faster Merkle trees than what I'm doing right now, but this is a super simple way of doing it. Um, the way a, a simple, like a, a Merkle tree can deal with odd number of inputs is simply when you have an odd like, number of leaves, you just hash it with itself. So if I get five transactions, oh no, I'm running out. I'm going to use red. Okay. If I have five transactions, three, four, five. Okay. Let's start hashing this from the bottom up. And I, I will get to why Merkle trees are cool really soon. But we're going to hash this. So we're going to have H1, H2, this is a two, H3, H4, and H5. This, this we're going to hash. This one's going to be hash of h1 concatenated with h2. This one here is going to be hash of h1, sorry, h3 concatenated with h4. By the way, this, this double bar usually means concatenation. Um, it's more than in just cryptography, but just in case. Um, and this, we don't have a match, this lonely one over here. So we're, this one is literally just going to be hash of H3 concatenated with H3. And that gives us a different hash, which is just cool. And by the way, we repeat this. So these two form one. This one also has to play solo. And then over here, we have the end. And now what's cool about a Merkle tree? The fact that we have the hash of every single one just at the root. Because that is a, that works as a proof, in a sense. Because now, when we hash every single node and we hash bottom up, then, uh, and by the way, these things are not commutative. You can't just flip it, by the way. So, so the hash functions are not necessarily commutative when you append strings. But we're proving that this order and this like, chaining of trees at the top is always going to give me some, some hash. You know, it's called HX. But l l it's going to give me some hash, some verifiable hash. And this, essentially, because, because of this property, right, then Nobody can change any of the data here because it's going to propagate up the tree. So if I were to try to alter a transaction here, right, not going to work because the whole hash of the tree is going to go down and then it will not go down. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be different. And then if you're working in distributed consensus, which is the real implementation is what they actually do, um, then obviously you're going to have a different, you're going to get a different result um, for the overall hash of your block. So. That's a problem. Yes. So the transformation from t, like T1 to H1, like there's a function applied to T1 to make it H1, right? Yeah, that's a hash function. So it, well, truly, I mean, it's but we're, we're, hold on, we're not making T1 H1. Right. We're, we're generating. It. Yeah, we're generating an H1. We can even append it to T1 if we so wanted this to. Capital H function. Yeah. It's, sorry, sorry about the notation. It's really bad, but but that's because I need to I need to make try to make a different notion. So let, let's okay, let, I'm going to be consistent because it's clearly confusing. Capital H is going to be applying a hash function. Small h is just going to be the actual output. output. Okay. Sure. So capital H means I'm applying a hash function on h1 and h2. 
And this is the result. Um, and then over here, let's have a smaller case h and call it hx, which is going to be the whole, or you know what, even, even let's call it hr for root. That's going to be the, 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 the department you're going to try to avoid. But hr is just the hash of the whole thing. So let's actually fold our little tree in the, the right way. So what we need to do is we need to only deal with, well, we're, we're going to do this without mutation. Um, we only need to do, and th this, is, this is, I guess, this is more a computer science question with applied cryptography than it is um, cryptography question. We just need to pattern match on a list and check whether it has essentially, w we need to essentially iterate and build a tree once. And then every time we build a tree, um, like, sorry, every time we, we group it. So we're going we're to do, like, we do this part first. And then, so we started with five, and now we have a list of three, right? So first we hash the five, then we end up with a list of three, and then we're gonna reapply the function, and then check how many we have. Then we have a list of two. And then when we reapply the function again, we're gonna check that we have a list of one element, and then that's gonna be our Merkle tree. So, I mean, this is, this is the easiest way to think about it, in my opinion. Uh, feel free to disagree. But, so let's make an inner function called fold, def fold recursive. And then let's just say it takes some list. Now, I, I made a lot of helpers, hoping that more scholar people will be here, but it's okay. Um, shot one. So let's call it fold recursive, and it's literally just a pattern match. And by the way, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna concern myself with um, stack safety here either. Um, this will overflow the stack. I mean, um, the other way is that it, I can keep a state parameter and pass it to a function. But again, I'm I'm gonna do this as fast as possible. So. Let's, we're going to match on the list. So let's say we have x, y. Um, by the way, for Haskell folk, this double colon is your single colon when you're pattern matching a list. So just do that mental swap. Um, they're inverted in Scala. I don't know why. So let's say x. you have x, y, and rest, right? Oh, sorry. I forgot the case word, keyword. So x, y, and rest. So that means we have x and y. So, so we clearly have two, two, two Merkle trees. Um, so now we're going to pattern match on it. So actually, sorry, we don't even need to pattern match on the internals. We just need to, whenever we have two elements, we're going to make a node, right? And then a node, let, like, let's, let's make the auto completely work because I don't remember. So left is a Merkle tree, so just x. Right is a Merkle tree, it's y. And then we need the hash, and we're just going to consider the hash the concatenation of each hash. That's simple. Hash of each and just plus, plus exactly. You got it. Good job. That's exactly what it is. So this is, by the way, this is a TSEC API. So to make it easier, call it hash pure. Um, I'll, maybe I'll talk about that, maybe not. This is, it has to do with the JVM specifically. But I'm going to call it x.hash, and that gives me a hash. And then I'm going to concatenate it with y.hash. And this is going to give me a hash. This is a super simple. And by the way, this is using the TSEC API. The reason why it's called hash pure is because the actual type class. So we have a, I have a type class where I actually abstracted out this concept where I have hash bytes, and it returns it in an effect. Now, usually, hashing functions are pure. But with TSEC, we are calling, I have a module which is over this really nice security library called Lipsodium, which is doing FFI. So that's unsafe, thus effect type. I wanted to abstract over possibly doing FFI, so yeah. But for the JCA modules, I added a function called hash pure, because it is pure, just using the JCA. So, Sorry? What about it? Uh, you the font, sorry. Oh, do you guys know how to do that on IntelliJ? Uh, presentation. I don't know how to navigate on it though. Uh, let me let me let me check. Sorry? No, I don't, I don't think Control Plus works, does it? Nope. I I undid everything. Thank God for Vim. No, but I have I have idea of him, so all my key bounds are messed up. Oh, really? Well, it's under view. It's under view. Am I blind? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, wait, it works. How do I navigate though? I don't know how to navigate files. Okay, it's okay. I'll, I'll enter and re-enter. I'll exit and re-enter every time. That's fine. I, I think there's a shortcut key. Anyway, so simply, if, if x, y, and rest, we're going to 
have a node and we're going to concatenate it. So this again, this is the this is the the, the funny Scala stuff. Um, so triple triple thingy just means essentially we're going to concatenate it with another list. So we're actually going to make our recursive function is going to return a list of Merkle tree of A. So we're going to concatenate it with oh sorry not A, we're not being generic here. Um, it's going to be with full rec. And again, this will blow the stack, of course. But, you know, stuff happens. OK. And then there's another case when it's just x and nil. That means, like, of course, if, you get, if you're Haskell guys, you guys know. Um, oh, wait, sorry. Did you write your code domain twice? Sorry? I have to. It's called. You do write it twice. Okay. Yeah, I have to. I don't have a choice. If, if I don't, then the compiler will throw an error okay. for recursive function calls. So it's going to tell me, like, it's not, like, there's no type defined on fold rec. So that's just a Scala limitation. Um, again, this thing, actually, I can just literally just copy paste. And wherever it's x, it's y now. So x, x. And then we don't need to, actually, and now we, just, we can just return the singleton list here. Yes, this is what I was talking about here. Remember, our little, our little lonely ranger, transaction five, gets concatenated to itself, and then it gets concatenated to itself again, right? So this is a, this is a pretty dead simple implementation that blows the stack. But because we're not going to call too many transactions, it's going to be OK. And then we're going to do this. Then we're going to call another, we're going to make another sub function. Let's call it um, extract tree. We're going to have m be same thing. Except now the code domain is going to be a bit different. It's going to be a Merkle tree. So what is the thing? So what is extract tree? Extract tree is what I was talking about, the stages. So I'm, I'm going to make sure I create these three nodes first, then these two nodes, and then one. So all I have to do for hash tree is keep calling it until the list is a singleton list. And if it's not a singleton list, then clearly you are a bad person. Um, it should be a singleton list. So we're going to do something really unholy and throw an exception. Um, in reality, you should never throw an exception. But um, So we're going to say, you know, um, case x nil. We're going to call, so if, if, sorry, yeah, if it's x nil, we just return x. If it's anything else, we're going to call fold rec. We're going to call extract tree again, and we're going to, on the, What's it called? On the result of fold rec of m. And then our fold to tree function is simply just extract tree of our list l. And that is our implementation. And that is the super dead simple one. Again, this blows the stack in Scala because it's not lazy. So this is going to, you know, and if the tree is big enough, we're not going to, you know, we're going to get a stack overflow exception. Um, Uh, do Scala long enough, you you will regret those words. Understood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. Sorry. You good? Good. Good catch. I made a to leave function to make it easier on myself. And actually, to leave, if you look at the implementation, is literally I made it from content to content, and then I took the bytes. That's it. It's like the simplest thing. I could have made a JSON, but I'm lazy. Was it F5? How to exit? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, wait. Yeah. I'm, I'm... OK. So now, I, it's just the thing that I, I usually don't code on this laptop. So I don't even know where my keybinds are at. No, this took me to somewhere else. <laughs> I was never even there. It's OK. I, I, it, it's only like a second more. OK, so now we need our work function. That's all. And we will be good to go. So now we have our almost block. We're going to define our work function super simply. And our almost block already has a Merkle tree. So M. So we're going to have almost block has timestamp and our tree, right? And our tree always has a hash. So actually, 
the nice part about this is that you know even at the root you can you're gonna get the hash of the whole thing. So we're gonna do this. Let's just call it until it recurs a function def check until. And this is why I guess it's really easy to use an integer nonce for the sake of checking. I mean just because this is gonna be a super that simple Im implementation. I'm gonna say it again. Don't use integer no integer nonces. They're not what you would want. But let's say we're gonna check until. Um, and it's going to be, what's it called? We're going to do, oh, let's say nonce. Let's have a incremental n. And then we're going to do this. It's going to be super simple. Um, we're going to do the hash. So, well, hash is equal to SHA1, hash pure. Of, now we're going to take the hash. What's it called? Hash of, by the way, I think I, uh, I'm going to import some syntax sugar because I'm a lazy person and I already wrote it. So we're going to hash pure the hash of the block. So the, um, do you guys want prepended nonce? I guess it doesn't matter. Um, the hash of the, essentially the, the tree first. Then we're going to concatenate it with the hash, with, with essentially the timestamp. So we're going to take the timestamp and turn it into a long of UTC, in, in UTC essentially in milliseconds. So we're going to get, uh, Epoch, I think it's epoch milli. And then we're going to say two bytes. This is syntax sugar. And then we're going to concatenate it with something called byte utils, which I made. And then it's called, uh, this is an int, int two bytes. This is a pure function. So I can do it with n, right? And then hash is an array. So, you know, um, what's it called? If hash dot take. We're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna do the, the slow way of course because this is so we're gonna say if the list is the same thing as and by the way this is reference equality so this is not great to usually do but in 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 general um, in Scala it's gonna be the what's it called for list is okay um, it, it's gonna delegate to the equality of the actual inner elements um, usually you want in in Scala Z. Um, there's a notion. There's a better notion of equality, which is triple equals, um, which is going to be defined on the type, and it's not going to come directly with the compiler. But I don't care about that because I want to just get this done quickly. So we're going to say the first n. You know, we're going to take the first n, and then we're going to turn that into a list. It's the same as filling the what's it called? The list with zeros. So and, and if it's the same, then what's it called? Uh, Shouldn't that be hard? Yeah. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. You're right. Good. I was testing you. Okay. You got to Sorry? Oh, you're right. Hardness. Okay. So, good catch. So, yeah. So, if, if it's the same, um, then it's essentially our nonce is going to be hash. Then message tree. So this, this is going to be, our, sorry, our nonce is going to be n, of course, because this, this means that we can verify the block. So that means if we, if, we, if we tried this nonce and we concatenated it in the exact same way, then we would get the same hash really quickly. Um, and our tree is just going to be the same, the m, m dot tree, m dot timestamp. That's it. Else. Check until n plus one, and then you see. So you see how this underlines it and it infers it to any. This is a nice part about subtyping that everyone loves. Um, no, so I have to have an explicit type description here. Um, please don't cr cringe, Haskell people. This is what we have to deal with every day. Okay, and th this is our work function. So now let's run it and hope everything doesn't explode. Okay, so if you exit presentation mode, so create a little server. I think I have Postman still. I know they deprecated comaps, but we're gonna, we're gonna play with it. So we're gonna have Postman here, and so we're gonna just bind it to localhost. We're gonna run our server and play around with it. We're gonna we're gonna essentially. Go through every so what what our server is gonna do in our little roots is that once it's actually done doing the work, 
I made sure that this is going to say completed block and it's going to prepend to this thing, right? And that's it. Um, I believe, yeah, that's, that's all we're going to do. And actually, let, let's, let's do a, what's it called? Let's say case post, uh, actually, this, this should be important. Ret root print chain. We're just going to print it to standard out. I'm going to say our, I think it's doge chain dot get uh, flat map uh, C I all the print print lin welcome to Scala dude okay this is, we're, we're gonna we're gonna observe the server and, and see what happens all right so let's see if I blow up the compiler with everything I did so we have hash exercises compile Despite all of this horribleness that you see, we're a really nice community. That's why I'm here. <laughs> so, you know, if, if, you, if you can take it. And by the way, Scala Z is like great people. Um, totally not a plug. But if you, if you can support the language, then um, Scala has a really, really nice and open, accepting community. Um, and we would love to have some of you. But all right, so let's let's play with our server. Let's send a bunch of messages. Um, this is literally like YOLO message. So we have, <laughs> I mean, who would send a message in a URL? So it's from Bobby, and then Drake sucks. Send one. No, I, I think Postman just encodes it. Okay. So Bobby's gonna say, uh, "Little pump rules." I don't know, I'm just saying it's random messages. Um, okay, it's gonna send it twice. And I'm gonna say lambda conf is awesome. Okay, so this is our setup. We have appended blocks to our messages to our thing. Now we're gonna call tick. So tick. Wait, something happened, huh? Null? Really? No. Scala, why would you do this to me? I feel betrayed, honestly. This is embarrassing. What could even give you a null? Fooled wreck? What is... Am I? No, I am. I'm doing both. I think. I did. Oh wait, let, let's see. Oh okay, hold on. Yeah, you you could be right. Um, is it in a full rec? Okay, so X Y rest. Sorry. You're right. Well. Okay, my bad. I think you're right. And it should be nil, it should be nil. A Scala compiler will, will accept a lot of things, including my bad programming. So this is this is the demo gods, by the way. If you've I'm not not sure how many of you have had this situation in a meeting. This always happens to me. It's the demo gods. Yeah. But I mean, it's also because you can just randomly throw an exception everywhere. So there's there's that. But you guys are right. You guys are better than me at this. I'm just gonna send the same thing a bunch of times. Okay, let's call tech. Okay, cool. And now let's call do work. Do work. Complete a block. <laughs> I did not add a string interpolator. But it did it though. Clearly it did it. <laughs> so, so let's do it again. Let's do it again. Yeah. Let me just add the string interpolator. I'm sorry. You That's my bad. Wrap, sorry? No, not yet. Oh, 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 you're right. I hope it actually prints it. Get of print chain. 
And here we are. So we have our Doge chain. And you, as you can see, is like our nonce ended up being 607. So we, when we concatenated a bunch of things, it tried 607 different not, like, numbers until it actually landed on one. And if we were we to hash this thing again, then we have our super dumb blockchain. And this is it. Um, and this is, this is our super, 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 super simple. But this shows, I guess, the, the properties of hash functions and what's kind of cool about them and what, how, what, why there's like 50 blockchain talks. It's kind of cool. Yes? Um, why is it bad to use an integer nonce? I mean, it's just because you don't only want to be worried about an integer. Well, for, for, okay, for one, generally what miners do is that they try everything. They don't just do integer nonces. And in general, you're not, you're, you're not just worried about incrementing an integer. Like, you're, you're essentially trying a bunch of random inputs, right? You kind of want to, you, want, you don't want to repeat inputs, but you do want to, you don't want to, essentially, you're going to have a better chance if you're not, if you're probabilistically not going from 0 to n. If you, else yeah. No, 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 no. It just... The Coinbase transaction is different for every miner, and so empirically people are not uh, starting from the same point. Yeah. Even though there's nonces might all, st all start at 0, they're not going to go to the same set. So it is okay to... No, but it, it is. It is, but no, but this is also because of random distribution, though. I mean, if you if you like, you are gonna have probabilistically a better shot if you try, like, it, under a uniform distribution of a hash. If you try different locations, not necessarily sequentially. That's why. No, yeah, yeah. The output is uniform, but if you're if you're starting from the bottom and sequentially, um, the worst case is that your thing is at the end. And you have, for example, um, say you could have 50% chance of it being in this latter half, then you're always going to take this long ass time to get here. But that said, this if is, you just try it randomly, then the odds that the 50% that you have to try it. It won't? Okay, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not going to close myself off to being wrong here. You're, you, you could be right, yes. Um, this is like all probability theory, and I am rusty, so yes. Um, uh, let, let's leave it at could be or could be not. Um, I, do, I do necessarily, yeah, I'm not going to say you shouldn't necessarily always use an integer nonce, but it depends. I mean, it could be that an integer nonce is super fast if you manage to distribute your nonce as well and you just use a hardware register to, like a hardware instruction to just increment an integer. So it could be that it's fast. But I just, I just kind of want to, I, I say don't use integer nonces mostly just because I don't want you to necessarily only think of a nonce as an integer. Yeah, that's it all. Doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be an integer. That's the thing. Like you could be, you could generate a nonce as a random string. You could also remember that nonces are not necessarily what's it called. They are not, you know, only the size of an integer. Like, oh, actually, the, that, that's another reason. Um, you do have variable length nonces, right? Um, for a hash function, the amount of nonces that you can try at an integer is much more restricted than you know because an integer is only 32 bits. So at some point. If you, for some probabilistic reason, did not hit it over 2 to the 32, then, you know, you're not going to ever get it. So if you use, like, a 256 bit integer or something? Yeah, you could. Yeah, definitionally, you will not run out of space because yeah. your input space is the same. Yeah, it's actually larger because you're appending the nonce to the thing. Yeah. But yes, exactly. So 